So just a quick introduction. Um, Tracy Fullerton is an associate professor in the Interactive Media Division of the USC School of Cinematic Arts and the director of EA Game Innovation Lab. Among her many credits, she is the game designer for The Night Journey, a project with media artist Bill Viola. Please welcome Tracy Fullerton. Great, thank you. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about two projects actually today, um, both of them games, but uh, both also uh, influenced by cinema. And I should actually say up front that um, I'm really happy and proud to be here as an alum of uh, Santa Cruz, um, class of 87. Um, uh, and so as a, a thematic link uh, between my discussions of these projects, uh, I wanted to use a metaphor really for the, I don't know if it's a metaphor, but uh, for the formal tension uh, uh, that exists between video games and cinema. Um, and that is um, the notion of granularity, um, by which I'm referring to sort of the level of detail or, or fineness uh, in, a, in a model or system. And in using this metaphor, I'm, I'm talking about both the visual uh, resolution uh, and the formal properties of the media. Uh, and, and both cinema and video games can exhibit granularity in important and beautiful uh, and, and very different ways. So I think it's an interesting, if possibly abstract way to think about how the two are related. Uh, the two projects I'm going to talk about are The Night Journey, a collaboration, as was already said, with the media artist Bill Viola. How many people in the audience are familiar with the work of Bill Viola? A few. Uh, so Bill's a, a, a video artist, a media artist, who's been working in the field um, really since its uh, inception. Um, he's primarily known for very careful, very slow, very beautiful um, spiritual experiences. Um, so uh, the other project is Walden, uh, which is a, a personal game adaptation of Thoreau's experiment at Walden Pond. And um, so The Night Journey, as I mentioned, is a collaboration um, uh, between someone who's a, a, a primarily a media artist, and in this talk I'm going to sort of conflate uh, cinema into its various uh, sort of forms, video cinema, I'm going to just sort of talk about them almost as a single thing. Um, but it's a collaboration between someone who's primarily a media artist and my team uh, of game designers at the Game Innovation Lab. Um, and the game is intended to be uh, a abstraction of the spiritual journey, um, but more importantly for this discussion it uses uh, embedded video pieces as part of its world design and its core mechanics. Uh, and it's actually currently on exhibit in New York uh, at the Museum of the Moving Image. Uh, the features of the game are really quite simple. Uh, there are several mechanics that make up the gameplay. Uh, exploration, reflection, transformation, and rebirth, uh, and possibly, if you quote unquote win, a release or escape from the, the world. Um, and um, I've talked in a lot of different venues about the development of these mechanics, so I'm not actually going to do that today. Uh, today I want to focus mostly on the media aesthetics of the projects. So the design of the game came right up against the tension that I think always exists between traditional linear media development uh, and procedural media development. Uh, to illustrate, uh, these are sketches that uh, Bill Viola made during the production which show his view of that tension. You can note at the top how, um, well, you can note how he's drawn the video streams um, uh, as a sort of matrix, uh, a group of modules, uh, very object-oriented, um, what I would call sort of granular in nature. Um, but he's drawn at the top, he's drawn the, the game world as seamless. And obviously, as a game designer, I would see that relationship uh, quite differently. Uh, I would have drawn the game world as a, a set of building blocks with video streams sort of inserted into that, that um, uh, procedural space. So where I saw seamlessness, um, Bill saw procedurality and vice versa, and that has a lot to do with where each of us came from. Uh, but we had to overcome assumptions like this in order to work together. Uh, here's an image of Bill and I playing an early prototype of the game. Um, we work in paper prototypes in my lab um, early on. 
Uh, this was kind of an aha moment uh, where Bill, I think, realized the expressiveness of what we could design with the rules of the game world. Um, so it was kind of like when I, as a kid, I thought I invented editing. I figured out that I could cut the film up, um, the Super 8 film up, and I would put it back together. And I told my parents I invented this whole new thing called, you know, editing. Um, I didn't know that I'd already seen it on television, but you know, you, whatever. It's exciting and it's empowering, right? That moment when you. Um, uh, when you sort of discover the underlying plasticity or granularity of any media, um, because it's a moment that you realize that you can do something with it, um, and it's just waiting for you to act on it. Um, but so again, as someone interested in procedurality, the cinematic potential seems quite limited when you first think about it. So we have sequences, shots, frames, fields, and we can address um, uh, and instruct the playback of these varying levels of granularity in film um, when we want to uh, uh, provide a sense of choice or change or effect. Uh, but it really is, you know, my feeling uh, that the play, if you will, in the traditional system of, of cinema uh, is somewhat limited. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons I began working in video games many years ago. Um, I'd studied film, uh, and uh, I felt, um, you know, I was looking for a medium that had uh, um, uh, less limitations on the ability to play with the, the pieces um, within it. Uh, so, but for the night journey, I was kind of asked to go back to that history uh, and relook at the possibilities and see if I could um, uh, find something interesting uh, in it. Uh, these images that I'm showing, by the way, are reconstructions of, of space from several pieces of Bill's work. And the Night Journey team used this methodology to better understand the original physicality of the spaces we were planning to build into our game world. Um, and I, I like them actually because they exhibit the kind of granularity that we don't often experience uh, in, in real-time cinema. By excerpting the frames and uh, recombining them, we create, uh, we create not only the same string of moments that exist in the original sequence, but a new moment uh, made up of several layered pieces of time. And that's, that's actually really interesting to me. And this notion of, of layering cinematic time in a game world uh, is something that kind of reinvested me, um, made me more interested again uh, in the notion of cinema and games. So when we were designing the, the Night Journey, we knew that we wanted to have the fineness of detail in our system, the sort of level of freedom that is available in a real-time 3D game world. Um, but we also were challenged uh, by Bill and ourselves uh, to create a, a, a game world that felt like it was a kind of a navigable video that didn't feel, quote unquote, like a, a, a typical uh, game world. So this meant that we had to find some common ground between these two very distinct types of imaging methodologies, and more importantly, um, between their kind of level of detail. In cinematography, we often talk about granularity as a part of the visual texture of the film itself. Uh, the way in which particles of silver resolve to make up an image, or how the pattern of noise, uh, which is visible in the emulsion, has its own beauty, um, even as it seems to obscure the image from being resolved by our eyes. Um, uh, and way down at the bottom of the spectrum, literally what we call the toe, um, the black sort of crush tightly together with the grain. Um, and something really interesting happens. Uh, I, I like that a lot. Um, in fact, some of my favorite video uh, and film uh, artists and Bill Viola is obviously one of them, have um, uh, enhanced and heightened the granular noise uh, in their images on purpose in order to get to what I would call a more abstract visual truth. It's almost as if that noise creates a challenge for us as viewers to overcome, um, which is almost a visual puzzle that we have to solve to find the meaning of the image. Uh, and having taken the time to solve it, uh, uh, we find the solution uh, sort of more worthy of our attention. So complexity in this case adds a value, almost a playful uh, value to the experience that clarity uh, doesn't provide. And again, there's something interesting there for me. So as you know, the, the visual granularity of video games is equally interesting, even though it comes uh, to be through a totally different methodology. So unlike the silver particles of film or the iron oxide of tape, 
um, pixels, our, our basic building blocks of visual information, are dressable and instructable, and um, they have this incredibly useful uh, level of manipulability for creating the responsive visualizations that, um, uh, as Michael told us, are the basis of video games. Uh, and so I think that this, this underlying um, granularity shares some qualities in common with those abstracted high noise images that I uh, sort of love so much. Um, but nostalgia aside, um, video game aesthetics are almost universally um, striving today to defeat the elegant simplicity of the pixelated image. Um, and whether we want to think of it as cinema envy or an attachment to sort of a renaissance ideal of realism, um, the effort seems to be towards a, a look and feel that has the sense of a cinematic reel, um, combining obviously with the manipulability of a game space. And even though it might seem counterintuitive, um, when we are working, um, you know, here we are working with a media artist, um, this sort of faux cinematic reel was exactly the kind of look and feel that we want to stay away from um, when we were creating the night journey. Because it's the kind of aesthetic that sort of shouts game trying to be cinema. And we wanted to, uh, the project to exist in a, in a subtler, more difficult to identify uh, visual space. One that was recognizable as a particular artist's aesthetic and not a particular medium's. Um, so um, as we developed the look and feel, we literally were tasked with incorporating this um, archive of images from Bill's uh, prior work into the game. We had hours of material that spanned a lifetime uh, of his work and which were intended as basis for the world. Uh, and sort of the, one of the really mind-bending uh, media design questions we had to face was how to get these materials to feel integrally related. Um, and early on, we tried doing things like matting portions of the video into the game world and having sort of walls of video, and it all felt really wrong. It was like we sort of had circled these objects in our world and said, here's something different, here's something that doesn't belong. Uh, meanwhile, we were also ex uh, experimenting with uh, using pieces of the video as textures uh, in the world, and we had more luck with that, um, though you really actually could still see the difference at that point. And the human brain is just incredibly good at recognizing the difference in resolution. Uh, and <laughs> when you, um, you know, you might have accepted our world as fairly detailed, the minute you put a piece of video next to it, our, our pattern finding brains could pick the real, quote unquote, real image out right away. Um, and so these are actually some clouds from a, a piece of desert footage. Um, and here's a sort of top-down view of the way we broke those clouds up. Um, and, and they actually currently ring the world. Um, but so as I said, we needed to find a common ground um, between these two uh, very different and distinct types of imagery. Um, the relatively sort of hard, simple edges of our real-time navigable 3D world uh, and Viola's pristine, carefully captured video world. And surprisingly, we um, found that commonality in noise and delay. So while we were look, working on the look, we developed a whole suite of post-processing tools trying to figure out creative ways to manipulate our imagery. We had a lot of fun with this, but nothing, again, nothing felt right. It all felt sort of forced, um, as if it was a trick we could do or a switch we could flip. Um, at one point, actually, Bill came over with a bunch of pieces to show us for inspiration. And a lot of it was shot during, using a cheap, out-of-date surveillance camera he purchased at a swap meet uh, many years ago for $25. Um, this is a guy who works with really high-end HD uh, technology as well. And so this, this actually sparked an idea for us. And we tried using a blank frame of noise captured from Viola's cheap camera as the basis for our digital noise and our post-processing uh, method. And it turned out to be exactly what would help integrate our sort of flat, flat 3D world with his deep cinematic images. Um, so um, each frame you're seeing there, each frame in the night journey is actually comprised of two frames. Not two fields as in video, but two frames, two distinct images merge. Um, as each frame is rendered in our 3D engine, we literally push it back through the graphics bus to be processed with noise and composited with the current live frame. The processing also includes, includes some uh, blur and um, pushes the gain up so that the whites bloom out really fast. Um, this is actually a really archaic digital methodology. So modern shading methods are fast enough to produce something uh, close to this effect in real speed without going back through the bus. But um, when we look at this, um, we actually made a test version of this on the PS3 
Um, and we weren't happy with it because um, it didn't have the sort of delay that we were looking for. It didn't have the, the sense of, of um, sort of uh, those two images being merged. Uh, and I think that you know one of the reasons is that we continue to use this archaic method uh, is the same reason that Viola chooses to use the um, archaic video technology. And um, we do it really to enhance the granularity of the image and to focus on that delay itself, um, to create a sense of time almost stretching your vision as you move through our world. In fact, the more quickly you move, the more the delay is apparent. Um, it's disorienting because uh, players are used to clarity uh, and sort of visual complexity requires a lot of mental processing to decode as we're trying to navigate uh, the game world. And we think this is actually a good thing, um, that we've achieved what we set out to achieve, uh, and that is to create this subtle, complex visual aesthetic uh, that shares some properties of both its game and cinema uh, antecedents. So I have a few more moments, and I'd like to talk about a, a new game that I'm working on right now um, in regards to this theme of granularity, and that is, that is Walden. And um, the basic idea, uh, we're actually just currently in, up to our elbows in design on this game, so I'm, it's hard for me to sort of uh, abstract enough to talk about it, but the basic idea of this game uh, is to challenge the player to live the experiment that uh, Thoreau set for himself over his two-year stay at, at Walden Pond. Um, so this is a screen from a very early 2D prototype. Uh, briefly, uh, for, you guys probably all know this, but Thoreau's goal was to live a life of simplicity, wherein he sort of um, supported his basic needs, and he articulates these in the first chapter of the book as food, fuel, shelter, and clothing. Um, he actually lays out the system of the game, in a sense, the challenge, um, uh, and yet not to become too uh, entrenched in, in the daily uh, sort of uh, support of these needs, um, to make sure that there's a balance um, uh, between sort of seeking higher levels of inspiration and his relationship to nature um, and these, these more basic needs. So to be simplistic, you might think of the game a little bit like Animal Crossing, but without the constant pressure to upgrade your house. So <laughs> in Thoreau's philosophy, you don't need a bigger house, right? You need to go out and interact with the world. Um, so the game takes place in an abstracted simulation um, uh, of the woods where Thoreau lived, and we've used his writings to develop our um, uh, sort of the, the sense of place, but also the database of flora and fauna. So focusing on the wildlife that Thoreau writes about the most. It's not intended to be a like simulation of what's actually there, but a simulation of what he wrote about. Um, and our level of detail is based on um, very um, uh, sort of time-consuming coding of the text. Um, make, that made the most sense to us to allow the original data, which is Thoreau's manuscript, to shape our uh, game's environment. Uh, but of course, we're limited by budget. We have none. Um, time and resources. Uh, so visually, <laughs> we've tried to make the experience quite simple. Uh, instead of persistent meters um, for how you're doing, um, uh, we're using the look and feel of the, the natural environment as your state meter, so your main state meter. So, so when you're in balance, um, your basic needs are fulfilled, your energy and inspiration are high, the world reflects that state, um, and it's sort of lushness and the potential interactions. Um, and when you're out of balance, the world loses that luster um, and much of its potential. It's important that it not lose all of its sort of beauty and, and potential, but because um, frankly, uh, we expect beginning players to sort of be in that state um, quite a bit. Um, we don't want to make a, an ugly, unfun game. Um, but we do want the game to, uh, to reflect the state of dullness that comes from a life focused only on attending to one's basic needs. Um, so, of course, the opposite is also true. If you're able to balance your basic needs and your more ephemeral needs, the world become more lush and be filled with more potential to achieve your ultimate objective, which is to experience the sort of um, peak moments and discoveries that fill your journal and eventually become the book Walden. Um, it's an interesting problem for us to use the world as a meter because it requires a kind of visual acuity on the part of the players to absorb that sense of the, um, the game world. Um, that while there are shooters that use sort of this, this sense of dulling the world um, to tell you their health is, is falling, um, this is not just you're going to die. This is uh, your overall relationship in the game. So 
Uh, it's a different form of visual granularity and a different form of, of expectation of the players. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up because uh, I'm out of time um, by noting that my thoughts about granularity are not really um, about the property of any particular media. Um, we might really have just as well discussed literature or painting here. Um, it's a metaphor for playing with the underlying potentials and resolutions of uh, media in combination and translation, uh, integrating these various levels of modularity and perspective, and breaking the rules of the expectations of what particular power of abstraction we should employ um, is an incredible tool. And I suspect that um, we as game designers are only at the beginning of seeing what we can do with this kind of cross-media vocabulary. And that's it. <laughs>